because we had no idea that our second child would have spinal muscular atrophy. And so I write about the whole process of it, but he goes kind of limp and we do a bunch of tests. We're um, in Winnipeg visiting family. From there, we come back to Calgary and they have an incredible medical team that basically lifted every rock, did every test. And we got a confirmed diagnosis when our son Lewiston was about two and a half months old. And basically from the time we checked in the hospital in August to, um, we didn't go home. He ended up going through the unit and through ICU and eventually we have a children's hospice here in Alberta and we spent quite a bit of time in that hospice we could live there as a family they have a family suite but we just knew if he didn't have fight we would have to let him go it's a very challenging thing to navigate but we knew the disease and the end outcome and we'd done a ton of research there wasn't any drugs there was only some clinical trials and we just didn't have access to what we needed to maybe give him the best shot at life and so he passed away just shy of his six month birthday sorry to hear, sorry to hear. Mm-hmm. And, and in that period like you talk about it in the book that you chose to bring the joy through that mm-hmm. period so how like when you initially found out after the two months like what period through that timeline did you choose to bring the joy the day of his diagnosis <laughs> the day of his diagnosis wow wow yeah so um it's august 5th you know it's a beautiful sunny day all of the we're, we have a fairly new children's hospital it's beautiful they're celebrating their 100th year this year and our foundation's committed to raising a hundred thousand dollars for them which is awesome but the building that they're in is actually really new i think it's 13 or 14 years old but they had kids help design it and one of the great things that they did is they had all the patient rooms face west which means you get sunshine and a beautiful view of the mountains and it's it's stunning there's no buildings obstructing it it's just like this um, big space. So we get the diagnosis. I crumble to the floor. I use a lot of choice words that rhyme with truck, start with the letter F. <laughs> and we finally pick ourselves up off of the floor and we just go out to the back of the hospital and, and in where all the patient rooms face, they have like a kid's playground that's accessible. They have a track and field. They have a soccer pitch. They have like a putting green, like all of it. It's amazing. And we just walk the track. And I mean, I wrote this book on like, it's called Bring the Joy and it's a about following the nudges of your heart and how when you follow those nudges, that leads to the joy. That's the gist of it. You can go buy a copy or I can summarize the whole book for you. There it is. But I talk about the choice. I talk about the nudge that you get, then where you're faced with the choice and then the joy that it brings. And I had been nudged several times to like pursue my husband to to check out these kids. Like all of these nudges have led to these most incredible, you know, mountaintop highlight real moments. And I remember getting this nudge and it was like a whisper from God. It was like, do you just bring the joy and in your head you're like how the f am i gonna bring joy my kids terminal dying and they literally were like hey your son's dying we don't believe he'll make his first birthday and there's nothing we can do except to make him comfortable like it's not news any parent is like great sounds great well it's gonna be awesome Mm -hmm. like you're like what the actual Hi, and welcome to another episode of Unlocked From Within. Today's guest, we have Jessica Jansen, a wife, mother, speaker, coach, philanthropist, author of Bring the Joy and Joy Bringer. After loss and massive heartache, she made it her life mission to help women get unstuck after experiencing grief and loss. Her mission is all about embracing the beautiful chaos and helping you understand we don't have to have it all together. She believes and knows that we can build a life by design that we once only dreamed of. What Jessica knows to be true is life is short and we need to live it to the fullest. So let's dream big go anywhere and do anything today let's welcome jessica jansen hey jessica welcome to the podcast unlocked from within how are you today i'm amazing i'm so excited i actually love this conversation because it feels surreal that i'm like talking to someone on the other side of the world and you sound hilarious to me you're like (laughs) i'm like it's 18 but um i'm excited to dive in Awesome. Awesome stuff. So we'll get straight into it. I just finished uh, your book, Bring the Joy. It loved it. Loved it. I listened to it on Audible. And what I like hearing with Audible books is hearing the author's actual voice. Um, I just feel like it brings that connection. And yeah, so I really loved it. So um, 
love to get into your childhood briefly. This is such a crazy question. I just recorded a podcast yesterday and I've never been asked these questions typically. And now the last three people are like, talk to me about your childhood. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> there's like this new theme. You know, I I think I had an amazing childhood. I really, truly did. I'm from the center of Canada. Um, the closest city is called Winnipeg. My parents are farmers. Um, my parents have been farming for 40, almost 43 years. My brother, my little brother is now a partner on the farm. Growing up, I hated it. And now as like, an adult who's 38 with her own children that's like holy I can't believe how hard my parents worked and they like did all the things for us and they're amazing epic people because I think you don't know how good it is until you know how hard it is to work for those things um my parents always had room for one more uh we had to work growing up like there was no sleeping in on weekends and Saturdays my mom would be like your father's coming into the shop everybody places um you know I think she tried to give us a little bit of best of both worlds but you know we grew up with four channels and bunny ears and TV and not, no cable and one TV and not that we were like oh so hard as me but it's very different from how our children are growing up and what I'm used to I learned the value of what work ethic and you know you, the saying you make hay while the sun is shining that was very true about our family farm and everyone pitching in and I couldn't wait to get off of the farm I was like I'm gonna move to New York or become a CEO and get me out of here and now I'm like oh my gosh can we go back and um, my parents just flew myself and uh, my two kids uh, flew us back for harvest which was really special. And I was just like, golly, I really, I like, I miss this. And that value of a family working together in a business, everybody chips in. And if we wanted friends over, um, they were coming to work. They weren't coming to like play Barbies. You know, dad would be like, the trees have to be out and you got to finish cutting the grass. And so if you want Laura to come over, that's what it's going to be like. And now looking back, I was like, well, those are some of the best lessons because nothing was um, just like, you can do whatever you want. Like there truly was this, you want something, you got to work for it. And I saw, uh, the gift that my parents gave us, which was sacrifice. And, you know, my dad had to truck in the winters when, you know, it was really tough years. And um, they, my parents have been happily married for uh, 40 years. 42 years and what's really amazing wow. is I had I it's crazy my That's grandparents crazy. my both both my mom's parents and my dad's parents were like 62 and 64 years before they passed so I've had this incredible example of family and my grandparents were kind of Mennonite not super strict like where we're wearing like you know head coverings and in the whole <laughs> thing and not being able to watch tv but you know dancing led to sex and you know don't ever have a glass of wine and I think things loosened up but I came from a faith background um, you know, going to church and that was just part of it. My parents never forced it upon us. It was just like, hey, this is what we do as a family. And my dad's like, you want a free lunch on a Sunday? Your ass is at church. <laughs> but if you're not at church, I'm not buying your lunch. And and you know what? Kudos to him. They never forced us. It was like, you get yourself up out of bed when we were at that at that age. And I had a great childhood. I got bullied a lot as a kid. I don't, you know, know why. Looking back on it, it was really hard. And I struggled with mental health. You could now call it like this is now an, a much more normal conversation. But um, um, I bounced around to a couple of schools. I went to a private school, felt like I got extra bullied, tried to public school, went back to the private school and I was in a dark spot. And I think just chemistry, brain, um, how your brain is wired. Um, I attempted suicide in grade 11 and thankfully I wasn't successful. My mom found me. I just broke my wrist, had a painful uh, bottle of uh, pain scripture or pain um, prescription pills. And I took the whole bottle as about 50 pills. And my mom didn't wait for the ambulance because we were rural. She just rushed me into the hospital. And um, my story wasn't over then. And so I'm very aware of mental health and um, self-care, if you want to call it that, and just being conscious of what I know I need to be at my best because um, I've battled some crazy um, depression and some really dark thoughts. And so I've got really great tools and um, you're like, why would that happen? But I had great parents. I think it's just like, sometimes your brain doesn't function the way you want it to. And so really thankful. I've got really supportive parents that way. And two amazing brothers were totally all opposite, not even close to being similar. And um, I've had a, I've had a really good life. I have no complaints. Wow. And, and how old were you when the bullying started? The first bullying that I can remember that was really bad was in grade six. Yeah. Um, so I would have been about 11 and they, like really starting to get clubs and like the cool kids. And then you weren't yeah. invited to so-and-so's birthday. And we rode the school bus. My mom was our school bus driver. And, you know, you there was two bus runs and it was just like 
you're not invited and you you're not going to be part of the club and depending on where you lived and we lived kind of we didn't live in the community we lived on this farm so it just it was you couldn't walk to anyone's house and so I think there was some distance challenges and then yeah I just was the person the target the big um, target on her back and so it was like rotten broccoli and apples in my shoes and in my gym wow. bag then it was like they pulled down my pants and gym class and and just like compounding things, you know, the three-way calling. Do you remember? I don't know how old you are, but like you used to be able to call someone three-way, but the person was hidden on the phone and you didn't have to call display. So you didn't know who was calling. And then <laughs> you'd be like, oh my gosh, don't you think that Kathy is so rude? And then Kathy would be on the line and like, you're, you know, and it just like dumb stuff, dumb, yeah. dumb, dumb stuff. Wow. Wow. And like, so I guess from that, that, that age on when you would have had poor self-esteem and that just led into the no, no? like I, I I I honestly and I I mean you could ask my mom because she probably maybe has a better recollection I didn't have poor self-esteem I kind of just forged my own trail yeah. I think like you'd have those thoughts of like why won't they be included and more so of just it was uh feelings of hurt and like you weren't included not so accepted yeah, exactly. So I wasn't like, I'm ugly. I'm fat. I'm, I didn't struggle with that. It was like, what's ro- wrong with me? I just want to be included. And now like my husband's like, he'll walk in, in the house and there'll be like three strangers. And he's like, here's my wife. Of course, she's just including whoever would be left out. Cause that's just like my default setting where you're like, I don't want anyone to feel left out. Like, of course there's room for one more. And that's very much so how my parents have raised us. And so yeah, I think it was more so of just like trying to find my path and almost that people pleasing where you're like, okay, relax. Sorry. Sorry. I don't know what that was, but That's so good. Long, <laughs> yeah. long story short, I think it was really just like not figuring out where I fit in. And often we try to people please to fit in. And Mm. thankfully, after 38 years of life and crazy experiences, like I'm not trying to fit into your group. I'm like, this is who I am. This is where I'm at. Like you either like it or you don't. There's 7.4 billion people on the planet. How bad or I'm not going to be everyone's flavor. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. With primary school, like I didn't have bullying. And then mom and dad sort of sprung on me that I was going to a school in high school that I'd didn't know I was going to and didn't have any, didn't have friends or a network. So it's sort Mm -hmm. of, that was about 13 years old. And um, it was like, yeah, where do you, where do you start? And you go through. You're starting fresh. You're starting fresh. And, and yeah, you you just, that's when I first experienced bullying and I'm just like, what is this? And it took about a year, year and a half of just the trying to work out the different groups and where do you fit? And I just was like, wow, this is, this is crazy <laughs> to experience. So I, I understand where, yeah, how you would have felt in that moment. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's wild. And now like my heart just breaks. Like I, I got really mad. I have a seven-year-old daughter and last year they were forming clubs at school. And like it, I, like you could just see the PTSD in me and I was, I was weeping and it makes me weep now. I was like, we don't do clubs. Everybody's welcome. You mm. always will have a space that there's always room for one more. Mm. even if it's inconvenient or they don't fit like it's like great then they're sitting on your lap then you're finding a chair then you're building a chair like whatever you got to do let's bring in one more person I I so that it's going to be an interesting thing and now there's social media and there's cyberbullying and there's like a whole nother layer and level to this and um I know it's it's inevitable it's going to happen that's just the way of it so I just my prayer and my hope is I can just equip her with the tools that she'll be able to navigate it mm. and I know it won't be easy but just that she'll feel like she can come out the other side and that yeah. her choice isn't to end her life or to try that and that's unfortunately the reality for a lot of people yeah yeah definitely definitely <laughs> and and was there like looking back like is there a lesson or a gift like you feel that it's you know, added to your, your tools? Like, have you been able to reframe it, give you a different type of perspective? Totally. I mean, it goes back to like, I want to be known as the home that like, of course you're welcome. Of course you can be included. So that's how, you know, with my husband, I think it's a little bit crazy where he'll walk in the door, like I said, and there's like, okay, you're here at my house. Hi, I'm Ronnie. Nice to meet you. And, um, I also think for me, it was the gift of, um, not trying to fit in. Like that's taken me a really long time 
but just of like, I'm going to forge my own path and it doesn't have to make sense to other people. We're often, well, I want them to like, or what would these girls think or how, like, I just, I'm, I am so confident in like what I'm doing. It doesn't need to make sense to the outsiders. It doesn't even need to make sense to some of my friends because they're not living my life, paying my bills, you know, tucking in my kids at night, sleeping beside my husband. And so I think those as tough as they were then now having the confidence and the assurance and the tools to navigate that it's just brought a lightness for my life and scary as hell, but I think it really extends compassion and grace and I can apply that in my everyday. That's awesome. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Did it in your, like going into your adult years, did that theme come back up again, the bullying or it didn't resurface? No. I finally, I moved to, so I'm from just outside of Manitoba or just outside of Winnipeg, Manitoba, a small town in um, the center of Canada. I moved to uh, Calgary, Alberta. So really close to the Rocky Mountains. Moved out here with $300 in my bank account. So stupid. No plan. No, like, I know all these people. Like it was dumb. Clearly it's worked out. I have an incredible life. I'm living an extraordinary life. It's, it's wild and beautiful. But I, I just, when I came here, I, and maybe you'll remember this, I think it's in the book. There's some chapters that didn't make into the book, but I just remember sitting on that front porch being like, this is the start of a new chapter. And I get to be the one that's the author that's going to write the story on the pages and I want to write it well. And so I just was like everything, all the beliefs that people had about me, that I was too crazy. I was too this. I was way outrageous. I was outspoken, whatever. I was like, I don't have to bring that that past Jessica into this. And I think that's the beauty of when you move to a new city, like, and you don't know anybody. Cause you're like, no one has any preconceived notions about me, or I'm not trying to like redefine myself in front of people that know me a certain way. And so that big shift, that big move was very freeing for me. And I think it just gave me the confidence to write a really great story. Mm. And when you meet me and you see me in person, I probably will be the loudest, the craziest, the wildest, the uh, most outrageous clapper, the one that's like, oh, oh. Like I just spoke to a corporate oil and gas client and they were like, next up, we're focusing on whatever. And all of the blue suits are sitting there. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and everyone's like, what? But I just like, that's, that's me. That's my authentic self. Like, I'm just going to go all in and get jacked up about yeah. a focus project or about, you know, this next step. And so I just have let that pass go. And it was really beautiful to redefine and just say, I'm just going to step into the fullness of who I was created to be. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. that's awesome. That's all. And if there's anyone out there listening, like you, you said, it was about 16 years old that you, you attempted suicide? Yeah. Yeah. I think I was 15. No, I no, I was driving. So I would have been 16. Yeah, I was 16 years old. So if there was a parent or someone, 50, well, yeah, we can even go, you know, in their mm -hmm. teens, kids are feeling suicidal. Mm -hmm. Like after that attempted suicide, what were some of the tools or strategies that helped you on your way? Mm -hmm. My mom and I just had this conversation the other day and um, we felt like, I think the system a little bit failed and I'm not going to point fingers or place blame. The, I mean, we have a charity here in Calgary um, that we run, my husband and I, and part of the funds go to Alberta Children's Hospital and they're building a new mental health facility for young adult um, adolescents and young adults. It's like, this is a pandemic. You want to talk pandemic. I'm not talking COVID-19. I'm talking the p mental health pandemic. Globally, and then it's, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then it's exasperated by a global pandemic of COVID-19 <laughs> and the wildness and the isolation and the loneliness that so many people felt. So we've poured money into that facility through our charity because it's under that umbrella. And I'm obviously very passionate about helping teens. I don't know if back then they really, because if you look at me, you'd go, you don't struggle with suicidal thoughts. You're totally fine. You're the most joyful. You're Jessica Jansen equals joy. Like you people know me like, oh, you need a, a speaker on joy, hire Jessica. So then it, I think it's asked backwards because with mental health, you don't look ill. I don't mm. look ill. You wouldn't be like, oh, she's struggling. She's in the depths of despair. Now, some people wear depression on their sleeves and they'll be like, oh, I'm alive. Yeah. But other times you're like, I'm alive and I'm doing the things and I'm paying the bills. But then something comes at you out of nowhere and your brain goes into this like, you're a piece of shit. You're a failure. You're a loser. It'd be better if you weren't here. You're worthless. How that, can you that voice, this out? that negative voice. Yeah. And so those are thoughts. And the scary part is, is sometimes we don't have the tools inside of us, or you're literally just brain chemistry is not wiring. The, the receptors aren't firing, whatever it is, and you need medication, you need help. So if that is you, if you're, if, if you're, and I had this conversation with my best friend, I was like, what do you mean you don't have suicidal thoughts? Like never, like you've never been like, oh, I just, 
And she's like, no, never. I was like, oh, like, I'm like, this sometimes can be a weekly thing for me that I'm like, and I know how to navigate them. So if this is you and you're a teen or you're young or whatever age you're at, I think for me, part of it is just like, I have no shame around it, but I'm like, hey, this is where I struggle. And this is really hard for me. And I might need your help. And I don't expect them to be my savior, but maybe they're, they'll they help me drive me to appointment. Maybe they'll just check in on me and be like, are you in a dark spot? Have you gotten out of bed? Have you had a shower? So I think just like having this open conversation and I have an amazing friend, her name is Victoria. I can't say enough good things about her, but when I start to go down to a dark spot, Victoria is my first call. I'm like, it's not good. I'm going dark. And then she just is jumping in. And so it's like, find your safe person that won't judge you, that will just meet you in the mess, that will meet you in the muck. That's awesome. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Like, is it, so I, I've had suicidal thoughts in the past, mm-hmm. but is it from a person that's had the suicidal thoughts to actually taking action on attempted suicide? Is it a whole different level? Um, I haven't I, done, I, I haven't, like, I have not gotten close where I've like grabbed a, a bottle of pain um, prescription painkillers. I haven't yeah. gotten to that point. You know, I've been driving in my car being like, man, if I just drive off this off ramp or Mm. if I just smash into that pole and thankfully I haven't, I like you, I'm like, snap out of it, Jan. Yeah. yeah. That's, and so that's where I'm able to shift and you're not going so dark. And, Mm. um, I know that's not some people's reality. And so I think it's just about, whoa, that's a thought. And that none of this is true. I'm not like the failure that I'm a loser that I'll never figure it out. That's all bullshit from the pit of hell. And now I'm going to start speaking truth. And that's what my friend Victoria would do. She would just start speaking truth about me to me. And it's hard because you're like, okay, I know this stuff, but you're like, my brain isn't just believing it. And that's where it's like, go see a therapist, go get medication. Have you worked out? What is your health like? Have you had, like, have you slept? Like there's some very basic things, your mental health, your physical health. Have you slept? Are you taking your vitamins? What's your body chemistry? Where are your cortisol levels at? That's like a very basic place that you can start. And then when those things you're doing all of them and it's still not firing now, we're like now, and it's like therapy, life coach, medication, going to my doctor. Like that's when you, you like, I, I, I mean, call it play the game, but I know the tools. I I'm like checking in on the things. It's like, Oh, right. I'm just exhausted. I got two and a half hours of sleep and I'm like going, I'm about to burn out. Or it's like, Oh, I've done all the things and I'm doing all the things and I'm not okay. I'm booking a doctor's appointment. I'm getting into the therapist. Having that awareness. Mm -hmm. yeah awesome awesome and then from from your early 20s when you went to that you had a clean slate a new chapter where where did you go on from there oh man wild ride I got here I had way too many different jobs I thought like Calgary's a boom and bust on gas city like when I moved here it was we were in a boom and you could be picking your nose and someone would pay you 45 dollars so like great we need people and we have this insane budget so here's 45 dollars to sit there pick your nose um, those, those glory days have gone, but I had a ton of different jobs, bounced around, was in sales. Um, I started working for this amazing company. They ended up selling and going public, which was wild. And, um, they, if I wanted to stay, I had to move and sell potato chips and I wasn't passionate about selling potato chips. <laughs> and so I got this amazing job at a company called Jugo Juice. They're a smoothie company. And that's where I met my husband. And um, we were not friends. We did not like each other. He thought I was a stuck up B. I thought he was a total asshole. Long story short, um, he had a crazy overdose and the guy should be dead. He's not. um, He's been uh, clean from drugs for almost 13 years, which is amazing. Um, With no relapses, knock on wood. And I became his friend and from his friend, I became his best friend. And I just, I fell madly in love. He was a mess, but he had this incredible heart and he's super hot, so hot, super athletic, like all the things that like you, I wanted in a man, he's really tall. Anyways, I confess my undying love to him three times and we're working together and it's a wild ride, but here we are. We've been, uh, we'll be married 10 years this July coming up. Congratulations. Thank you. Three children. And it has not been easy. It has been so dark, but it's been so good. And what I know is like, we're guaranteed death and taxes. And the third thing that we forget to talk about is the tough stuff. And so I just found my partner that I want to do the tough stuff with. That's awesome. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. And uh, three attempts of wooing him. him. Um, Over how many years was that? 
It was honestly over one year. Like one I'm a year, very, yeah. I'm like a very like, I, and <laughs> after we dated for a year, I was like, listen, if you don't want to marry me, then get the hell out because I want a family and kids and I'm, I'm in my late twenties. So figure it out. And like, he's the type of guy, all of his friends, like they date for seven years and then they're engaged for three. And I was like, I don't have that kind of time. You know, I grew up in a Christian home. And so it was like, before we move in, you know, you need to be married. And there was some of that, like, you know, old school thinking. And I just knew I was like, either you're in or you're out. But if you don't know after being with me for a year that like, I'm your person, let's not waste each other's time. I'm a very forward, like not afraid to say it. And when I said that, then he was like, holy shit, like, I don't want to be with you. And we had been dating for a year and a half and we broke up. I had just moved in, hadn't told my parents it was bad. My mom had to fly here. I'm like, mom, I don't even have a home because I moved in and I was lying and I didn't tell you. And my mom's like, I'm not stupid. I knew you moved in. Anyways, all the things. And um, we got back together at the beginning of Stampede. And he was like, you're my person. I'm a, I have very high expectations. And I think I just scared the shit out of him. He's like, I don't know if I can meet your expectations. I'm like, you probably won't be able to, but let's just do this anyways. And I, if I, if I'm being honest, he's blown away my expectations. He's a really uh, incredible husband and incredible father. And to be able to put up with me in itself is like, you're a treasure gem. So I got myself a keeper. And and you talk about in the book, like that first year of marriage, that, that was, that was quite oh. a struggle. Yeah. Marriage is hard. So hard. Like <clears throat> you take two people, you're totally different. The way that you make the bed is not the way I make the bed. The way that you cook the steak isn't the way I cook the steak. And then I think when I got to my grandparents, like when I looked at them, like, you know, that you don't sweat the small stuff and you learn to appreciate the corks. Like, that's what they did is like, they appreciated the silly things where I think I was like, oh, that's how you do it. You're a loser or like whatever. And the first year, I think we were just butting heads all the time. There was a ton of fights. Um, I didn't think he was driven enough and I'm super driven and he didn't dream the same way, same way that I dreamed. And I remember we went to a, a, a therapist at our church and the counselor therapist was like, come back to me when you have a real problem. You two just need to learn how to get along. And literally a year later, we had some major problems. My husband's dad gets into a tragic car accident in Mexico. He ends up passing away. And then we end up having our daughter. And then shortly after that, we have our son who gets a terminal diagnosis. And so like, we actually had some very tough things. It wasn't just like the way you take out the garbage or not load the dishwasher annoys me. And I just remember Ronnie kept fighting. We were fighting often, but he kept saying, I just want you to be on my team. Like I was always trying to prove myself, which if I look back to my childhood, I think I was always trying to prove that I could fit in, you know, farming family. My grandfather was like, you shouldn't drive the combine. You should be in the kitchen just generational things. I was always trying to prove that I could fit in. I could do it. And I was like, I think because I was trying to fit in as a child, you know, like find the cool group, be a part of it, be included, be accepted. So this like work ethic and worthiness piece. And then for him, I was, I think, trying to prove that my way is better. And I've gotten da 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 rather than admitting, Hey, I'm not okay. Or admitting like, uh, can we figure this out or being willing to learn. And when like push came to shove, we knew that like we had to learn to be on each other's team and that means like letting go of some of the things that really just aren't important anymore. Like to this day, my husband will not drain. Like I put a drain saver in there. So like the food, we don't have a carburetor so that it catches the food. He will clean the kitchen, but he will never lift that up and put it in the garbage. And I've just chosen, I'm like, the guy cleaned the kitchen 90% of the way. I got 90. Like you either focus on the 90 or you focus on the 10. And if I just mm. focus on the 10, the 10 becomes the 90, which is the thing that then you're just looking at all the negative. Yeah. And so I'm just like, every time I'm like, damn, he cleaned the kitchen. Amazing. And he left a little bit for me. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna, <laughs> like, it's really, it's like, how hard is it to pick up the thing and tap the food out? Yeah. And I want to say it to him every time he leaves it. I've just learned that like, I'm not, that's not a hill I want to die on. Yeah. Hills that I want to die on. How are we raising our kids? What morals and values? Those are the things that you like really can fight and be passionate for how he loads the dishwasher, the lack of how he puts his shoes just so. I mean, blessed be there's stuff I do that drives him crazy. So it's like, I always say this to people when they're struggling marriage. I said, choose your heart, choose what mm. heart you want to face. And that's been a, a shift for me. So I don't want to choose my heart over what's in the drain or how he loaded the dishwasher or didn't load it. Yeah. I'm going to choose the heart of like the big stuff, the big stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And how long ago, like before you met, met your husband was when you were, um, caring for the, the kids with SMA? 
Yeah. So I started um, caring for these two kids that have spinal muscular atrophy. Sean and Shania, they were six and four at the time. That was in 2007. And then I met my husband May, 2009. So two years after I'd been caring for them and caring for them on a fairly regular basis. And so I involved him in this process. Like, Hey, there's this family. They have two kids they are in wheelchairs. They're amazing. But I take them to my parents' farm. And if you're going to be a part of my life, that means that they're part of your life. And he would help me and go on dates and drive them to the movie theater or whatever it be, whatever it was. And, um, he was a really incredible partner. That's awesome. That's awesome. And what did you learn, uh, caring for him in that two years? Like what, what were like Mm. the struggles? Um, so with spinal muscular atrophy, you're robbed of movement. So mentally, cognitively, you're very sharp. You're fully there. Your brain's firing. It's wiring. But physically, you're very limited to what you can do because your muscles weaken. The um, Our nerves need these proteins to be able to keep, they die off and then you reproduce them. They're reproducing in me and in you and in the average person. I hate saying average, but in your typical healthy human. When you have spinal muscular atrophy, the nerves will die off and there's no proteins to reproduce them. So once that nerve dies off, it can no longer communicate to muscles. Well, you need to move your muscles or else they atrophy. And so I remember it was really, I think it was like the first week I was caring for those kids and I I got into my car, I just started weeping. I just wept. I bawled like a baby because I was, you know, in my early twenties and I was like, I don't think I've ever been like grateful. I can just open a car door. I can brush my own teeth, wipe my own ass, pick my own nose. Like we all do it. Mm. We all pick our nose. We all wipe our butts. And I was just like, I've just taken all of that for granted where these kids, they didn't have the muscle strength to finish their dinner. It was just like, by the time they got to their fifth bite, that movement of, and I was like, oh, I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. Grab a drink, take a sip, open the fridge, grab a glass of water. These are like the most basic of things. And that really shifted gratitude. And the biggest thing I took from them was just being thankful for what I was able to do and to not take it for granted because it can shift in the blink of an eye. And I just remember that that lesson for me was like, whoa, I've taken a lot for granted. That is so basic that we just expect to be there. And it really helps me like when I'm running or I'm working out or I don't want to do another rep or I don't want to pump up the volume on my treadmill. I like, I just go like, I might not be able to get to do this again. So Mm. I'm going to go give her. And yeah. I'm I'm going to, I'm going to push a little bit harder. I'm going to soak it in. I'm going to just enjoy that I can move. And so I don't want to go for a walk. I don't want to be outside. It's cold. I was like, I know people that would die in this moment to be able to zip up their jacket, put on a tube and just stroll around the block because it's freedom. And so it was a massive lesson for me that's definitely shifted perspective and really given me a different posture of my heart. That's awesome. That's awesome. And then going into, so you went into your first year of marriage and then how long after that did you have your first child? So we got married in 2013. We had our daughter in 2015. So two years, essentially. Two years, yeah. Um, and then our daughter was four months old, found out we were pregnant with our second. We were told like, you might not be able to have kids. I had a bunch of stomach issues and, you know, hormones and I had endometriosis and I was celiac and I never got a regular period. And so we weren't sure what it was going to look like. And we have the exact opposite problem now where we look at each other and it's like, boom, there's a baby. So, um, I'm really fortunate and very grateful, but with that comes complications. We had no idea that our second child would have spinal muscular atrophy. And so I write about the whole process of it, but he goes kind of limp and we do a bunch of tests. We're um, in Winnipeg visiting family. From there, we um, come back to Calgary and they have an incredible medical team that basically lifted every rock, did every test. And we got a confirmed diagnosis when our son Lewiston was about two and a half months old. And basically from the time we checked in the hospital in August to, um, we didn't go home. He ended up going through the unit and through ICU. And eventually we have a children's hospice here in Alberta. And um, we spent quite a bit of time in that hospice. We could live there as a family. They have a family suite, but um, we just knew if he didn't have fight, we would have to let him go. It's a very challenging um, thing to navigate, but we, knew the disease and the end outcome. And we had done a ton of research. There wasn't any drugs. There was only some clinical trials and 
we just didn't have access to what we needed to maybe give him the best shot at life. And so he passed away just shy of his six month birthday. Sorry to hear. Sorry to hear. Mm-hmm. And and in that that period, like you you talk about it in the book that you chose to to bring the joy through that mm-hmm. period. So so how like when you initially found out the two uh, after the two months, like at what period through that timeline did you choose to choose to bring the joy? The day of his diagnosis. <laughs> the day of his diagnosis. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So um, it's August 5th. You know, it's a beautiful sunny day. All of the, we're, we have a fairly new children's hospital. It's beautiful. They're celebrating their 100th year this year. And our foundation is committed to raising $100,000 for them, which is awesome. But the building that they're in is actually really new. I think it's 13 or 14 years old, but they had kids help design it. And one of the great things that they did is they had all the patient rooms face West, which means you get sunshine and a beautiful view of the mountains. And it's, it's stunning. There's no buildings obstructing it. It's just like this um, big space. So we get the diagnosis. I crumble to the floor. I use a lot of choice words that rhyme with truck, start with the letter F (laughs) And we finally pick ourselves up off of the floor and we just go out to the back of the hospital and and in where all the patient rooms face, they have like a kid's playground that's accessible. They have a track and field. They have a soccer pitch. They have like um, a putting green, like all of it. It's amazing. And we just walked the track. And I mean, I wrote this book on like, it's called Bring the Joy. And it's about following the nudges of your heart and how when you follow those nudges, that leads to the joy. That's the gist of it. You can go buy a copy or I can summarize the whole book for you. There it is. But I talk about the choice. I talk about the nudge that you get, then where you're faced with the choice and then the joy that it brings. And I had been nudged several times to like pursue my husband to to check out these kids. Like all of these nudges have led to these most incredible you know, mountaintop highlight real moments. And I remember getting this nudge and it was like a whisper from God. It was like, do you just bring the joy? And in your head, you're like, how the F am I going to bring the joy? My kid's terminal and dying. And they literally were like, Hey, your son's dying. We don't believe he'll make his first birthday. And there's nothing we can do except to make him comfortable. Like it's not news. Any parent is like, okay, sounds great. Well, it's going to be awesome. Mm. Like you're like, what the actual, Yeah. but I just remember it was like that same moment where perspective and I was like, okay, dang, if that was me, I just wouldn't want it to be sad and depressing. Like FYI newsflash, we're all dying Mm -hmm. at some point. Like if this is my last day, I'm going to have a great, deep, meaningful conversation with you, Marty. If like, I I don't, I'm tomorrow's not a guarantee. Now I'm doing everything I can mentally, physically, spiritually to keep myself healthy and on track, but that life happens. I just remember being like, if that was me, I just wouldn't want it to be sad and depressing. And I think we think death and then we think sad and depressing, your life's over. And almost it's like, it gives us the ability to turn up the volume and be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like we're paying attention. It's like blinders are off. And now we're like, okay, what are we doing? Where are we investing? How's this going to look? What do we, can we say no to? Cause you're like, their time is not on my side. And that, that commitment right there, I told my husband, I said, I don't know how we're going to do it. I just have this deep belief that it's possible. And I've applied that lesson throughout my whole life. I don't know how, faith, but I have deep belief, faith that it will happen. And every time I have that, I eventually figure it out. And there's neuroscience that like, if you have this deep belief, your brain will just start offering you ideas. Like you get 60,000 thoughts a day. Some of the thoughts are really stupid and really dumb. We've talked about that. And then some of them are actually brilliant. And it's a little bit scary to act on them because you don't have a guaranteed outcome. But the worst that happens is, is like, oh, that wasn't the right thing. Okay, on to the next amazing idea or crazy idea. And every time I've showed up with that belief, the outcome and figuring out the how always comes into place. That's awesome. That's awesome. And through that period, like how did you find, you know, like, you know, was it checking in on each other on a daily basis? We we use both checking in on each other, uh, you know, also being aware to check in on, on your, your, your other child as well. Like how did that all, you know, finding the, the balance in the chaos. Hmm, I don't believe in balance. Like that's just bullshit. Even in my life, like my life for lots of people, you're like, you're insane. (laughs) 
And I, I think we like, even just that word balance, like, I mean, if you can see this, but like, there's a teeter totter, it has its center point. And for you to have balance, you have to have equal weight perfectly. It means you can never shift anything or you can never give something a little bit more attention. So I've stopped trying to achieve balance in my life. For me, I'm just embracing the seasons and the rhythms of my life. Shift that perspective, everything shifts. I mean, my mom, she literally basically said bye to my dad and um, lived with us. She lived in our basement and she would take care of her daughter. She would do our laundry. She would bring the things from the house while we were in the hospice. And I, if I'm being honest, I don't remember a lot of caring for my younger daughter. I don't, which sounds horrible, but I think partly there's PTSD and you, there's certain things that I choose to remember. And then we just leaned heavily on the community um, to take care of, to help, to support. And so my mom, like my mom and my daughter have a really special bond, but um, I don't remember a lot of caring for her. I remember just being so focused on Lewiston. And so that was wild and crazy. I don't know if Ronnie and I were like, let's check in today. I think the difference has been we really grieved differently and that was a big struggle and strain in our marriage. So we had been married for three years when Lewiston got got sick and we had finally felt like we were like good because we had worked really hard and then it got really bad again. And like, I think we, the way I do it is the right way. So the way I grieved was very externally, sharing it publicly, going to events, networking, starting a charity. And my husband went internally and wanted to be at home and be safe and never be away from her daughter. And I needed that. And it just goes to show how we're wired differently. There's not a right or a wrong way. And now oh, what I would say is that we spent a year and a half butting heads again and being at each other and fighting over really dumb stuff. And that's just grief, you know, working itself out. And now like we ask some key questions like, what kind of support do you need from me this week? How can I best serve you? Is like, is there anything that I can take off your plate? Like just asking those simple questions so that somebody knows that you're on their team and like, Hey, you know what? I'd love if you could check in and make sure I get this thing done in my business. Or, hey, could you pick up the kids? Because I really need a, two extra hours. It's been a little bit crazy. And now I think we didn't do it really well then, but it's taught us how to show up really well now. Oh, well, that's awesome. That's awesome. And like go, going through, you know, through the day to day of bringing the joy, you're still feeling all those emotions and feelings yeah. of the anger, the resentment, victim mentality. Why me? Mm -hmm. What was the things that got you, you felt the, whether they were tools or strategies or, or moving, were, were you exercising through this period, mm -hmm. finding time to yeah. exercise? I, so I was a spin instructor. Uh oh, oh, I was a spin instructor uh 2012 and so involved in the fitness industry really loved it the fitness community totally surrounded us embraced us did fundraisers and and lifted us up lululemon um here their canadian company but you know known globally they invested in our family heavily helped us with one of our first major fundraisers they um flew me out for a global ambassador retreat in Hawaii of all the places to go. I was like, this is the most epic thing. And, and so that was part of being involved in the fitness community and, and sharing her story. But knowing for both my husband and I, we both know we're better when we exercise. So like Monday night, I didn't want to, but I couldn't get my workout in the morning. I had two and a half hours of sleep. I always work out Mondays at 9 a.m. It didn't work out. And I said, babe, I've switched my workout. I know it's right after dinner and I'm, I'm not going to be able to help with bedtime. He's like, go do the thing. And now, so we've just made that a priority that like fitness is a part of our life. And I worked out at a gym here that's got a bunch of hockey players and, and, you know, superb athletes. They took me in and under their wing and just to like get out and grind and work with these you know, really elite athletes was really incredible. And I would say movement and working out is can save your life, literally. And you often don't want to lace up your running shoes. Um, and that feels like the biggest hurdle, but it's like, once you get your shoes on, you just got to take one step forward. That's it. And then I promise the next steps will come. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. And you are able to create a, with the charity, you've been able to raise over a million dollars. What, what are we're, you at We're now? nearly... We're nearly $2 million. Wow. Congratulations. Yeah. In five, That's five amazing. and a half years. Mm -hmm. wow. It's it's incredible. We have this incredible community and like half the people we don't know and we, we've never met them. They just believe in the work that we're doing. And we've been able, like I said, to pour back into Alberta Children's Hospital here locally. But we just saw all the gaps. Like 
one of the things we are just fighting for care so we could take our son Lewiston home and he had to meet with all these people and fill out all this paperwork and I just remember this one meeting in a conference room in ICU and they're like yeah like we just don't think that you like really qualify for full-time care I was like if if my son chokes or can't swallow his saliva he literally dies if I'm not in the room suctioning him helping him with his breathing equipment and they weren't gonna supply us with any at-home care and I just remember like wanting to flip the table and, you know, give them flip the birds and just being like, F you. And so in that moment, I was just like, I'm done trying to prove that I'm worthy of care. I'm just going to go care for my son, actually. And so that's why we stayed in this hospice and never left and went home. And because we had 24 hour nursing and doctor support, and it was kind of wild and crazy. And just seeing some of the challenges, especially helping Ashan and Shania, how much an accessible vehicle is. Do you know, like a wheelchair, like some of these wheelchairs are 30 or 40 grand. And it's not because they're like the, you know, freaking Maserati, and the like Royals Royces, they're just basic wheelchairs that now have a tilt feature so you can be comfortable or, you know, elevate you and raise you up so you can have a conversation while someone's standing. And so there's just like these little things. And so because of that pain, we've now been able to say, hey, we know how complicated it is. And so we help with respite and physiotherapy and purchasing wheelchairs and helping families give their children the best chance at the most normal. And I say that with quotations, but allowing their kids to be kids and then allowing adults to be adults where they can have some independence. And so um, there's lots of gaps in the market. I wish I could raise bajillions of dollars every year, but um, the small little bit that we are doing, we're really proud of it. That's awesome. That's awesome. And so from from on there, you now, you have, you've got a family of three kids now. That's right. Uh, and so how, how long after did your third child come along? So Lewiston passed away in 2016, November. Yeah. yeah. And then it took us a while just to kind of sort out life and business and grief and all that. I thought we would have had a child much sooner, but just the way that it rolled out, um, we, you know, looked at IVF, PGD, which is pre-genetic diagnosing. And so like you can, we don't have a problem getting pregnant. The problem is, is like now our kids, like, what does that look like? Um, but we tried naturally. And so we got pregnant in uh, 2018 and had our third son, Hollis, uh, in spring of 2019 and I don't feel done. My life is very full. And my mom's like, where are you going to have the time for another child? I was like, there is no more time. I'll just figure it out. That's what a nanny's for. Um, but we've always wanted, my husband and I, we were like four, we're going to have four kids. And um, I love our children. They're amazing. But it doesn't feel like we're done. My daughter's like, no, mom, we do not need any. I do not want another brother or another <laughs> sister. She's like, all I, all I need is Hollis. That's her little brother. And then Hollis goes, me not need anyone. Me got wazy. He calls her wazy. <laughs> and so we hope to expand our family, but I'm just going to trust the process in that. And um, we'll take it one day at a time. And so from juggling juggling the family and then your your partner, he's got businesses as well. And you've got your yeah. other bit. Like, how, how do you? How do you make it work? Outsource, outsource, outsource. <laughs> ask for help. You know what? I think we're so ashamed to ask for help. And my husband is like mortified. I'm like the queen of asking for help. And lots of people offer their help. And then we never take it out because we're like, oh, I don't want to inconvenience someone. I was like, you offered? Great. Hey, are you swinging by the grocery store? Could you pick up this, this, and this? Because I forgot it. Or, hey, could you watch my kids? Because I got to make it to this meeting and I don't have childcare. And what I know to be true is like, if it doesn't work for someone, they just simply say no. And I just stop making it mean anything. And I know I can't raise children, run a business, have a charity, be a good partner and a friend and all those other things and do it all by myself. It takes a village. It takes a community. And so I've like ditched all the shame around asking for help, gotten really good at it. Um, my mother-in-law is a huge part of being able to fill the gaps for us. She's amazing. Like my house looked like a bomb went off yesterday and she came in here and picked up my daughter from school and was getting her ready from gymnastics, clean my whole kitchen while I was finishing calls. And I would say, just get good at asking for help. We have a part-time nanny um, who is amazing. She helps fold laundry and picks up laundry and does all of these things. And so um, I just know I, I, I physically cannot do it all on my own. And then we have a bunch of really good systems in place. Like my husband and I do what I call a Sunday session every Sunday where we map out the week and we map out the month and you know who's 
pitching in where. And I think it's just about like working a plan that works best for your family. And it means I can't do everything, but I'm just like really getting good at like, what's the most important to us and where are we going to place our values in? And so get good people in your corner. Um, there's lots of things I, I miss and screw up on, but you know, I, I just learned to, it's never intentional and, um, it doesn't look perfect, but it's a damn good life. Awesome. Awesome stuff. And with like, if someone was listening, that's going through grief, um, something similar to your story, like yeah. how, how do you, how did you find processing the grief, which you'd still have grief and you'd still process it. But what do you find helps? Having a morning routine is big, uh, taking time for myself. Like I'm not afraid where it's like, oh, am I a bad mom? Because I'm going to go to the gym when I should be like, I don't do things where I should, where I should be putting my kids to bed. It's like, they're going to remember how their mom was not that I was at every single, you know, bedtime routine. And so I was like, get really clear on like what fills up your bucket. That's a huge thing. And just because you lost someone doesn't mean that you have to lose yourself. I think in, in losing my son and is him in him passing away, I found myself. And, and I mean that in like, he gave me the courage to stop playing small and to go all in. And so grief looks different for everybody, but like get exercising, get moving. Don't, this is not an excuse for you to go and sit on the couch every day and eat a tub of Ben and Jerry's and keep the blinds drawn. Like you got to let the light in and some days you got to be the light. And, um, if you're really struggling, I would say, find a way to serve somebody else. Uh, as soon as we can do that, you change your posture, you change, um, you know, the chemistry inside of you. And so I just have gotten really good. And what's really filled up my cup is, is like, I cannot change the past. It is what it is. My son's dead. That's, you know, a fact of life, but I can ensure that his life has incredible meaning and he has a lasting legacy. And so I'm just doing what I do in his honor. And, um, I just wish more people would know that just because you lose somebody you love doesn't mean that you should lose yourself in that. I'd say, let this be the thing that catapults you to be the best version of you. It's amazing. It's amazing. Like I, I heard your story, you, you know, Lewiston's story and your story and your family story. Um, it's reached me in Australia. So it's reaching people mm -hmm. globally, the impact he, he's creating and his legacy. So it, it is amazing. Um, and you've got a, You've got an upcoming book coming out. What, what, what's that about? Well, it's like, I'm not there yet. I have, so I wrote a book. It's called Bring the Joy. It's on Amazon. You know, we've been slinging copies out of my garage. Um, I self-published with an incredible agency out of Austin, Texas. Shout out to the Fed agency. They were incredible. It wouldn't have happened without them. And I have another book and it's called The Hard Work of Joy. Like I have all the chapters mapped out and we've been pitching it to publishers and I'm getting, you're too small. No one knows about you. Um, we have already something in that category. And I'm like, yes, but you don't me. And so we've gotten a ton of no's and I'm still getting no's. And so um, self-publishing a book was expensive, especially in the way that I did it. I'm a great storyteller. I'm not a naturally gifted writer. So, which means you need help with the manuscript and all that. So the next book is called The Hard Work of Joy. Um, I'm praying to find a publisher, but I've made a decision. If I don't find someone by the end of this year, I will self-publish and will sling it out of my garage again. Um, is it what I would want to do? No, I would love a publisher that's like, you're in Barnes and Noble and Target and Walmart and Costco. Go and you know help with global distribution but um we know how to get a book out there we know that you can um, purchase it it's on audible we know how to do all those things so i would say look for it it's basically each chapter are these lessons of like i think people expect joy to be easy like they just oh it's gonna like i I buy myself a Starbucks coffee. Oh, joy, like, yay. Or I go get this new thing and joy, yay. And then we wonder why we're sad. We wonder why we're lonely. We wonder why we're struggling. We wonder why we have these negative thoughts. And it's like, these are all the tools. These are all the life lessons where it's like this. I've literally just rolled in my sleeves and I'm like, all right, okay. Another tough thing happening. Okay, we're almost gonna lose our house. You know, we're in small business. It's a global pandemic. I'm like, what are we doing? How are we gonna solve this? And I go back to these pillars into these life lessons. And that's where the joy has been. And like the tough stuff is coming. It'll come with us for the rest of our life. I know that. Ronnie and I are walking through some tough stuff. Um, and I'll, I'll share more of it once we're through it. I always have a rule of thumb. I don't share it while the, while the wound is still oozing. We'll share right. it once it's scabbed over. But 
like, instead of just wanting to quit and throw in the towel, I'm like, okay, we're in the tough stuff. What are we doing? Rolling up the sleeves. And now I'm just going through the tools of what we've done and how we've applied to get us through it. And that has provided so much lightness in my life and truly so much joy. And I want that for the rest of the world. I want that for every person that's stuck in grief, for every person that's stuck in their own negative thoughts, for every person that feels like they're coasting and it's not possible. I just want them to be able to have this insane belief that they can live an extraordinary life wherever you are. I had $300 in my bank account and no friggin' plan. And I'm like, I'm doing it. Life is good. Is it easy? No, but it's full of joy. It's full of joy and you're figuring it out along the way. And and mm-hmm. own and owning the uh the what would you say the curveballs of life? Totally. And they're they're gonna come the rest of my life. Yeah. I hope Ronnie and I will navigate the curveballs for another, you know, we'll celebrate 10. So I hope another 50 years, like we have a story like my grandparents, where it's like, no, it wasn't just perfect. Like we're but we're figuring it out. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I found like with my life, like there was a lot of struggle, like a lot of struggle uh from a financial side and and that's that you know going through life i'd be i'd looking back and reflecting i'd be addicted to the positive so when something positive would happen that feeling and i would not be owning the curveballs or the perceived negatives and so then i'd get stuck in in going you know that victim mentality of why me why is this happening and all that and then you know, going through and doing workshops, personal de- personal development, book, reading the books and uh, being signed off as a coach and whatnot and helping other people with, with this, uh, I found that, yeah, you've got to be able to own both sides. Like, like a car battery, to operate a car battery, there's a negative and a positive for the yes. car to start. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, here's the most powerful question that I've learned to ask. And I say this and I I'm a speaker and that's what I do and, and where I share my story, but the, we often will just ask the question why, and I can't take credit for it, it was from a message that our pastor at our church had, had um, said, but somewhere a long time ago, he, I can't remember what it was in context to, but it stuck with me is I don't ask the question. Why, why me? Like I helped these children. I had raised all this money. Like, what did I do wrong? What, did karma bite me in the ass? Like, you know, like you can go through all of this. Why can't my business be more thriving? Why are we struggling? Why is it so hard to make the mortgage payment? Why can't we have what those people have? How do they afford it? Blah, blah, blah. The powerful question when you're sitting in it isn't the why the powerful question is so now what so now what powerful powerful and then when you answer that question that's where the goodness comes mm. so another one i like i find i've got to i've got to tune in to be more aware of is how is this how is this serving me and mm. what, what's what's the good that's going to come from this because it doesn't yes. look it doesn't it doesn't look like good in that moment <laughs> in that state isn't that the truth yeah. where you're like holy we're screwed yeah. like yeah. i and yeah And then like, and that's truly shifting from a problem mindset to a possibility mindset. So what if you shift and you're like, what's possible? Oh, what's possible is like this really hard thing. Maybe I'm going through it so that I could then teach other people and help them and work through that. And then they are finding that freedom. And this could be where my business, you know, evolves. And like, it just like, it's a mind blowing when you have a perspective shift and you just Mm. start asking some great questions. Mm. Awesome. Awesome. And so Jessica, where can uh, people find you? They can find me. And no, I'm just kidding. I'll give out my address. No, I'm in Calgary, Alberta. So if you want to come hang out with me here, that's where I'm at. But um, no, the best spot is you can find my website. It's just Jessica Jansen, Jansen, J-A-N-Z-E-N or Z-E-N. I don't know how you Aussie say it, um, dot C-A. And then I'm on Instagram. That's like my main, I'd say social platform of choice. I just joined TikTok, but I feel old and like I'm a grandma and I'm like, I'm 38, but I feel like I'm 78. I'm trying to be present on there. I've only posted a, a few things. I think they're kind of funny but um yeah i'm on instagram and tiktok linkedin and then my website and if there's anything that resonated or connected um i'm i think an open book and i'm happy to walk alongside you and i just want you to know you don't have to be alone and so if you need to just have someone that has walked through you know suicidal stuff or who has lost a child 
um, please reach out. I don't want you to do this alone, nor do I believe you should. And I think there's power in community. And if you feel called and want to make a donation to our foundation, it's loveforlewiston.ca. And my book is on Audible and on Barnes and Noble and Chapters and Amazon. And so hopefully you can find it there and, and snag a copy and stay tuned so that either we find a publisher or I'm just rolling up my sleeves and saying, so now what this, so now what is this? I'm self-publishing again. Awesome stuff. Awesome stuff, Jessica. Again, thanks for your time today. It's been super inspiring hearing your story um, and and really loved your book. Um, I do think, you know, like I said, globally, it, it is making a difference and helping people in their lives as well. So again, thank you. Thank you so much, Marty. You're a gem. And I can't wait for you to come skiing in Canada. We'll go do a, a run together on a, one of the mountains here. For sure, for sure. Thank you again for listening or watching another episode of Unlocked From Within. Please subscribe and like and leave a comment and please share this podcast episode with anyone you know that it may help or inspire. If wanting any coaching or speaking by Jessica Jansen, check her out on her website, jessicajansen.ca. You can also follow her on Instagram at the Jessica Jansen, LinkedIn, Jessica Jansen. And if you'd like to do donate to the Love for Lewiston Foundation, check it out on jessicajansen.ca and follow on Instagram at love for Lewiston and at the Lewiston label. Thanks again and I hope you enjoyed the episode.